In our previous presentations, we understood what is big O notation and how it is useful. Through big O notation, we describe the performance of an algorithm with respect to the input size. This is what we learned in our previous lectures. Now, in this lecture, I will propose the formal definition of big O notation. This means in this lecture, we will understand the formal definition of big O notation. This will help us to properly understand and utilize big O notation. Let's get started with this lecture and let's see what are the topics. The first topic of this lecture is growth rate comparison of functions. First, we will compare the growth rates of two functions as this will set the base for us to understand the formal definition of big O notation. After this, we will move to the definition of big O notation. Let's get started with the growth rate comparison of functions. In this graph, we can observe the two functions fn and gn. Their growth rates are shown. Also, x-axis represents the input size. n represents input size. Both fn and gn are dependent on n. As we can observe, we have n here in both these functions. This means these two functions are dependent on the input size. As the size of the input increases, their growth rates changes. Now, I would like to ask this question. Is it the case that gn is bigger than fn? Or is it the case that fn is bigger than gn? I want you to pause this video and think about it. I hope you gave it a thought. Have you got the answer? Okay, if it is confusing, don't worry. If you ask me whether gn is greater than fn or fn is greater than gn, I would say that after some point, gn is greater than fn or gn is bigger than fn and this is the point i am talking about after this point it is guaranteed that gn is bigger than fn but before this point we cannot guarantee that gn is bigger than fn sometimes gn is lesser than fn and sometimes it is greater than fn but after this point gn is always bigger than fn. In other words, gn is asymptotically bigger than fn. Now, what is the meaning of asymptotically bigger? This word is new to us. When we say gn is asymptotically bigger than fn, we mean that gn is not always bigger than fn. But after some point, gn is bigger than fn. Or in other words, as n approaches to infinity or the input size approaches to infinity, gn is bigger than fn. This is the meaning of asymptotically bigger. gn is asymptotically bigger than fn means after some point, gn is always bigger than fn. And we can represent this statement as fn equal to big O of gn. Now, what does this mean? This means gn is asymptotically bigger than fn. So, through big O notation, we are telling that gn is asymptotically bigger than fn. Or in other words, after some point, gn is always bigger than fn. So, through big O notation, we are giving this guarantee that after some point, fn cannot grow more than gn. And that's what we can observe through this graph also. After this point, fn cannot grow more than gn. gn is always bigger than fn. This is the meaning of big O notation. So, through this graph, we got to know what big O notation tells us. So, here we compared the growth rates of these two functions. Now, as we are done with growth rate comparison of these two functions, let's move to the next topic where we will discuss the formal definition of big O notation. 
So, what is the formal definition of bigo notation? Here is the definition. Assuming fn and gn are non-negative functions, we are assuming fn and gn are non-negative functions and the reason behind this is that these two functions either represent time or they may represent memory space. Both time and memory space cannot be negative. Hence, we are assuming fn and gn are non-negative functions fn equal to big O of gn if and only if fn is less than or equal to c dot gn for all values of n where n is greater than or equal to n naught and c and n naught are constants fn and gn are non negative functions and fn is big O of gn or in other words, gn is asymptotically bigger than fn if and only if fn is less than or equal to c times gn for all values of n greater than or equal to n naught. c is some constant greater than 0. This means c cannot be negative or it cannot be 0. So, this inequality must be true for all values of n greater than or equal to n naught if we want to say that fn is big O of gn. In our previous graph, we saw the plot of fn and gn. We saw that gn is asymptotically bigger than fn or the growth rate of gn is more than fn after some point. Here in this definition, we are multiplying gn by some constant. This is because it might be possible that gn is not greater than or equal to fn. After multiplying it by some constant c, it may become greater than or equal to fn for all values of n greater than or equal to n naught. So, this is the reason why we multiply gn by some constant. Now, in order to understand this definition better, let's consider the graph of c times gn and fn. Here is the graph. In this graph, we can observe that for all values of n greater than or equal to n naught, c times gn is always either equal to or greater than fn. We can observe that c times gn is either equal to or greater than fn for all values of n greater than or equal to n naught. So, with this one thing is clear that gn is asymptotically bigger than fn or in other words, fn is big O of gn. And that's what we observed in the definition as well. Here we observed that if fn is less than or equal to c times gn for all values of n greater than or equal to n naught, then fn is equal to big O of gn. So, I hope with this graph, this definition is clear. In this graph, we can observe fn and gn are both non negative functions. Also, please note that gn is also called the tight upper bound of fn. Now, what is the meaning of tight upper bound? In order to understand the meaning of tight upper bound, we need to know the meaning of upper bound first. What is an upper bound? If we are saying that gn is the upper bound of fn, then after some point n naught, the growth rate of gn must be greater than the growth rate of fn. Or in other words, fn cannot grow more than gn after some point n naught. So, this is the meaning of upper bound. Now, what is the meaning of tight upper bound? The meaning of tight upper bound will be clear once we discuss some problems based on big O notation. After this lecture, we will discuss some problems based on big O notation. And in those problems, it will be clear what is the meaning of tight upper bound. So, with this, we are done with this topic. 
and this means we are done with this lecture okay friends this is it for now thank you for watching this presentation i will see you in the next one